Welcome to an oral history of the church. I'm Adam Christman. And I'm Jonathan McCormick. An oral history of the church is a conversational history podcast. This first volume is an oral history of the campus relocation of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's main campus, from Mill Valley, California, to Ontario, California. The school has a new name as of June 2016, Gateway Seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention. The twelfth episode for this volume is an interview with Miguel Rodriguez, local pastor of Lincoln Hill Community Church, prior staff, and alumnus of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. Miguel served for quite a few years with, uh, as staff of Golden Gate Seminary, and for for that reason alone, he would be a great addition to our study, but he also earned a degree here and is mm -hmm. uh, a local pastor at, as you mentioned, Lincoln Hill Community Church in San Rafael. Uh, for those who aren't aware, that's about mm, smack in the middle of Marin County, yeah. um, a significant, significant center to the county, and has a real urban impact as far as urban gets in Marin County. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very suburban and rural county overall, but uh, uh, he has a significant impact there at that church. It's it's right close to downtown for that city, and he was built for that, prepared for that by, in part, coming to Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. We've mentioned before that the intercultural dynamic of Golden Gate Seminary was an important part of Golden Gate's identity. Mm -hmm. San Rafael is a predominantly Hispanic area within Marin County. Mm -hmm. And the face of Christianity is changing. The, the centers of... Um, Christian growth are in the global south. Mm -hmm. um, Spanish speakers are going to have a continued uh, increasing influence in what it means to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Miguel, as a, a Spanish speaker, uh, he's part of that trend mm -hmm. and shows how Golden Gate is part of that dynamic of what Christianity is today. That's right. Miguel can straddle both lines as someone who uh, under was who's raised in America, who as is as American as you and I. Uh, he he knows it because he is it. Yeah. But at the same time, being bilingual and having such significant. Uh, relationships originally with family in Honduras, mm -hmm. but now in, increasingly with um, the seminary in Mexico and other other places in the global south. He's, he's got, I think, one hand on each side of that line. And he's... People may not realize it because he's the pastor of a reasonably sized local church in Marin County, but he's playing a significant role in paving the way for bilingual ministry in the 21st century. He is showing us, how do you do it? How do you do ministry in English and Spanish in the United States in the 21st century? Miguel is doing it, and Miguel is paving the way for all of us. It's not an easy task. Yeah. Which yeah. leads to another component of Golden Gate's um, ministry. Mm-hmm. He has been staff with the Contextualized Leadership Development Program, which grants certificates to um, ministers who can't relocate to the Bay Area. Yeah. Or really anybody who wants a seminary-style education who may not have the time, money, or opportunity for a more classical experience. We'll deal with this more in the the interview, right. but I think the CLD, Contextualized Leadership Development, is an important piece of the, the Golden Gate picture 
and I'm glad we got to hear from someone who, who had such uh, close contact with that program. I agree. Without any further delay, let's get to listening to Miguel. This is Jonathan McCormick and Adam Christman interviewing Miguel Rodriguez. The interview is taking place in room 223 of the academic building of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary at 201 Seminary Drive, Mill Valley, California, 94941. It is June 1st, 2016. Miguel, thank you for coming and talking to us. Absolutely, a pleasure. Thank you. Well, uh, let's just jump right into it. Okay. How did you first... Oh, and listeners, please forgive the creaky chairs. We're in a room with creaky chairs. <laughs> so first question, how did you first hear about Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary? We'd have to go way back to the early 80s. Um, I was saved in a little Baptist church in San Francisco, California, Valley Baptist Church, Valley Baptist church. under the leadership of Pastor Jim Pittman. And uh, we had seminary students mm. that would attend our church. So um, I don't even know the exact year, but I know at some point uh, my little body back then ended up on this campus because someone uh, invited us to come to some activity that was going on. And I remember coming here and just thinking it was like this magical forest, you know, just, <laughs> you know, you grow up in inner city San Francisco oh, yeah. and this place seemed magical and uh I think the first time I even drove in was nighttime, so there's just something mystical yeah. almost about it, and the deer, and uh, you know, so that was way back when I first had my experience uh, of knowing what Golden Gate Seminary was. Yeah, yeah. And I can ma- add more to that, but uh, I, I don't know if if you want any tidbit there. Well, how long? How did you first come to study at Golden Gate? How I started studying at Golden Gate uh, is another long story. Obviously, in some influence from coming here as a kid yeah. and then a teenager, um, seeing others come and making this making an impact, that really planted some strong seeds in me. Um, I was fascinated by the idea that these people that spoke English with different accents mm-hmm. wanted to come here. I mean, you'd meet people from Tennessee the South. That was some of my first experience with Americans from other parts of America. And it was just amazing to me that they were so interested in God Mm -hmm. that they would move across the country to study God's word. It just was a fascinating concept. So I think that stayed with me. And then my mom started to become, she became a CLD student uh, in the mid 80s, later 80s, excuse me, um, and she would go and take classes at night. Mm-hmm. And so um, my mom uh, had to recruit me because um, we would get on, we didn't have a car, so we'd get on the mm-hmm. bus. And, um, you know, it could be a little scary sometimes. So anyway, I remember wanting to watch the basketball game, Michael Jordan, Dominique Wilkins, whoever. Mm-hmm. And my mom was like, I need you to come with me uh, because you're going to be my bodyguard. And so that's kind of how my mom convinced me. I said, well, I got to protect my mom. That's right. So I would go to these classes and I would sit sometimes outside there, wherever it was usually in a church. And I would sit in some area kind of waiting, kind of bored out of my mind. I wish there was smartphones back then. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, but, you know, that kind of planted the seed that my mom thought it was important enough that she was studying the seminary on her level. Yeah. Through this program. Can you tell us, uh, for the listener, what is the CLD program that she was, what is that? Sure. She was taking classes with that. Yeah, CLD is Contextualized Leadership Development, and it's basically a diploma-level program for people that want to do seminary, but they're not ready to do master's level or higher work. So this program was designed to make it affordable and available and accessible for people uh, that were like, you know, regular church folks. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. So basically the first diploma is eight courses and with eight courses you get started. And that's that was a diploma in Christian ministry that my mom, yeah. you know, started out with. Now I know today they offer CLD centers in quite a few different languages. Oh yeah. Was that the case with your mom? My mom took actually took classes English? in English, okay. but there are CLD classes in Spanish, uh, Portuguese, Chinese. I mean, yeah. over it's been around for 30 years now, which is incredible. Uh, started in the early 80s as well. Um, and basically, I think now 
there's over 50 something centers wow. and back then there was probably a handful but uh, mm. it's just incredible how it's exploded and it's gone from probably you know anywhere around 100 students to now there's over a thousand students yeah. uh, nationwide wow. and there's people that want it to do it in other countries as, as well yeah there's been a little bit of that in the past but now um, I think there were limits on on being able to do that but now they're trying to see how to take it uh, internationally again they're looking at it. might be uh, using online stuff and all of that but yeah it's an exciting yeah. program and I work there too as well yeah. so I think I hear you saying that your mom took the courses at different sites Is uh, that... my mom pretty much um, I remember her taking classes uh, I believe it was it was a little african-american church near third street in San Francisco I wish I remember the name. I don't know if it was Calvary, but uh, uh, so she took classes there and she might have taken classes at a couple other sites. Um, I just don't remember now, but I remember that one specifically because we'd get on the bus and go there at night. So, yeah. Yeah. And she graduated in 96, I believe. So um, that was very impactful, too, to go to the Civic Auditorium in San Rafael and to see her and the graduation was just just very exciting. And that, that really got me to a place where um, I thought I need to keep going. And I actually did take a couple of CLD classes myself in my early 20s at the church we were going, which was Primera Iglesia Bautista in San Francisco. Um, and so I ended up taking a couple of classes with my girlfriend at the time. Uh, and um, the relationship didn't work out, but I kept going yeah. and learning. And, uh, uh, and I don't know if you want me to get into that part, how I ended up doing master's level. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, So please. basically, um, I got called to be a youth pastor in 97 to move to Fresno, which I didn't want to move to Fresno, but I did. And um, I did my undergrad there at uh, Fresno Pacific University. I got my degree in contemporary Christian ministry with a minor in history. And uh, then um, I continued to serve there at the church. And by 2004, let's see, three, I really started feeling again a tug in my heart about seminary. And three years after I had graduated graduated from FPU. And I started a process for a couple of years um, of debating whether to come in God's timing. And I ended up coming in the fall of 2005 uh, to do my um, first degree um, here at the seminary. And what was your first degree? I actually started off as an MDiv student, and I did quite a bit of it, um, but I eventually switched to the MAEL because um, I was a full-time student, I was working full-time, and I was in ministry, and I just couldn't pull off the languages. It was the only thing I couldn't pull off, so I switched to the MAEL, and I got that degree um, uh, fall of 2009, even though I walked in the spring of 2010. And I found out that I was only three classes short of another degree, so I just went ahead and did that for my Master's of Theological Studies, MTS. Mm, okay. And the MAL is Master's of Educational Leadership. Mm. Yeah. All right, so how did you first come to work here as well? You mentioned that you were working full-time. And- yeah, I was, I was, well, at the time, um, I was working three odd jobs. I was working at the library, I was working at after school with kids, Mm -hmm. and I was working at the Mill Valley Rec Center with um, activities. I was the guy that would put out chairs, put them away. Mm -hmm. So I was working three jobs, (laughs) (laughs) and I was going a little crazy, Um, and Don Bell, director of the CLD office, walks into the library, and to this day, I still believe he was recruiting me. He just says, hey, you know, would you happen to know someone that would be interested in this job? And it was the program coordinator job. And he described it and um, and he just talked about it in a way where I was like, he's describing me like this. (laughs) This job would be great for me. And so he had walked out the door and I'm like, wait a second, I I should go after that position. So that's what I ended up doing. I walked into the CLD office and lo and behold, the first thing I see Graduation picture, my mom in that graduation picture. Nice. I was like, you That's know, awesome. are there signs? Mm, perhaps, perhaps not. But that for me was perhaps a uh, a sign. Yeah. And so um, 
it ended up working out. Don thought I was great for the position. He hired me, and I worked there for six years from um, – Stole me from the library, and they still, still, re- you know, <laughs> library folks are still angry at that right. over that yeah. fact. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kelly Campbell, uh, the director at the time, she mm-hmm. still brings it up whenever I have a conversation with her. <laughs> Half joking, but um, but uh, uh, on interesting note, that was the uh, that was December of two thousand and six that I started working for um, CLD, and uh, six years went by. Um, yeah, it was an incredible, crazy experience, but an incredibly um, rewarding, and it really stretched me big time being the program coordinator uh, there. And I can talk a little bit about that if you want, or or whatever. So you studied here about, uh, let's see, you walked in ten, so about five years, four years. <clears throat> that you, yeah, and then you mm-hmm. you worked here for six. Uh, right. So right. you stayed on a couple of years after you yep. graduated? I was one of those people that couldn't get rid of me. So uh, <laughs> I stayed on. And uh, it's been interesting having different relationships with the seminary yeah. as both a student, as an employee. Um, it's It's been unique uh, and, and good, yeah. And you continue to teach for the uh, CLD program. Yeah, that's another aspect is that while I worked in the CLD office, uh, little by little, Don talked me into... Uh, becoming a CLD instructor and he thought hey it's good for you to get in the system and uh, if God opens doors for you to do that then you're good to go and so uh, I started my first CLD teaching experience I believe my first first was actually San Quentin prison helping to teach the um, church planning missions an evangelism class and I co-taught that with a couple other folks and I did the um, evangelism portion mm. and that was like an eye-opening experience really exciting really great and then after that I started teaching some Spanish CLD classes in Richmond and San Leandro mm. so I've had some experience with that as, as well and you've recently taken on more responsibilities at San Quentin is that right? that's right um, I've been going to San Quentin now for this will be my 11th year uh, doing sports ministry, but I've also been a part of the chaplain chapel ministry, uh, both preaching and through the CLD program. Mm-hmm. And so now it's incredible, but uh, they have asked me to take over as the new director for the North Bay School of Theology uh, at San Quentin. So um, I am literally uh, two weeks into into doing that, and. Uh, um, it's pretty exciting. I can't. I can't believe that I'm. Yeah. I'm getting to do that. So, um, got some pretty big shoes to fill in Don Bell's position. He did a yeah. great job. That's true. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they're real grateful for you, and I know that I had a great time teaching out there myself. I That's right. Out there from 2010 to 2015. Yeah, and I've heard good, good, uh, <laughs> uh, good feedback from your teaching there. So they 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 love Adam Crispin out there <laughs> at the seminary at the uh, at the prison. So. Well, you know. You, you always enjoy that, but you never want to stay too long. That's right. <laughs> you want to be, make sure that at the end of the day, you're checking out. Right. <laughs> and that's important. That's right. So what is your current role uh, or relationship with Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary? Uh, right now, um, I guess technically I am just an admirer. No, uh, <laughs> I, I'm admiring so from the outside. Yes, I am a uh, yes uh, secret admirer, but uh, <laughs> it's finally come out here. Uh, so you're an alumnus. I'm an alum- alumnus, and, uh, and um, secret agent. No, just playing. <laughs> um, I also volunteer. I volunteer when the seminary needs me to uh, promote or help uh uh, especially in areas with Hispanic work. Mm-hmm. Um, I recently, two months ago, went down to an event in Southern California mm-hmm. hoping to represent CLD and the seminary yeah. uh, to a Hispanic convention. Mm, cool. um, but uh, technically right now, the only real affiliation I have is through the CLD and being the director of the North Bay School of Theology. So yeah. that's my only real yeah. I think, official um, connection yeah. with the seminary. In your current job, you are... Uh, the lead pastor, senior pastor at Lincoln Hill Community Church. I am San the Rebel. lead, aka head honcho. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am the the big lead, pastor. the big cheese. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, I'm the lead pastor at Lincoln Hill Community Church. I've been there um, in San Rafael for eight years, but six years as the lead pastor. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
the church, we had our 70th anniversary last year, which was awesome. Yeah, wow. First Baptist yeah. Church, uh, which became Lincoln Hill Community Church around 2003. Yeah. And so it was very exciting to be a part of that, uh, to, to still be a part of it. But uh, that's a huge deal. And we were very uh, excited to celebrate. I think you and your wife got to be with us. That's right. Yeah. So that was great. And I hope you kept your bookmark, your 70th anniversary. That's right. We'll be doing something bigger for 75. And you guys will be invited. Bigger bookmark. No, bigger bookmark. We're going to go with a two-by-four bookmark. There you go. Um, so as a, as a minister in San Rafael, that's only 15 minutes drive. Right. Driving, driving um, under normal uh, right. road conditions. Yeah, so you're pretty close to the seminary. You could, yeah, it's you know, not... someone from here or vice versa could pop over in just about 15 minutes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're you're a minister in the local area where the yes. campus is currently located, soon moving away. As yes. we mentioned at the beginning, it's June 1st. Yes. Uh, boxes are packed. <laughs> I saw, uh, yeah. Filing cabinets are saran wrapped or whatever. Yes. <laughs> and they're getting yeah. ready to be shipped down. Yes. Um, yeah. So it's not much longer before the main uh, body of at least administrative staff and a lot of teachers yeah. go south. And then in December, everyone else vacates. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a strange moment because it almost seems surreal mm -hmm. that it's happening. Um, I think a part of me has been slowly grieving the loss of the seminary because several uh, of our leaders also were very much tied to the seminary, and so they are moving down south. So it has been a, a loss for us now for quite a few months, actually. And, uh, um, you know, I think that as a pastor, you live by faith, at least I hope you do, and um, you trust God is going to provide. But as a human being, you know, it does hurt to have that loss. And then I think of the memories of yeah. coming here as a child and just being totally impressed by God and then having a huge blessing to actually come and be a student here. It was like a dream come true. Mm -hmm. uh, preaching um, last December um, in that chapel that so many years I saw others. Yeah. And I even wondered inside myself, Lord, am I going to preach one day up there? And now the seminary is closing down and they asked me to be one of those last people, I guess, in a sense. It was mm -hmm. such an honor that it was unreal. That day is still in my mind just yeah. so surreal, yeah. uh, but it was so special. And so, you know, I, 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 I think there'll be moments where I kind of get choked up again thinking about this being no longer here. Yeah. But then I think there's a new chapter and something new. When God, God closes one door, then he does something new. And so I'm excited as well about the campus in Fremont. I wish it was closer. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm thinking God can use that in some way to impact the Bay Area. And uh, even with CLD, CLD will keep going. And there's even other folks that are interested in partnering to see how we can keep some of those going and yeah. recruit new people. Yeah. So that's exciting. And then obviously what's going to happen down south is exciting as yeah. well. Yeah, definitely. And it makes sense. It yeah. makes sense. You've begun sharing a little bit of this, but let's yeah. dig a little more. Sure. Uh, can you tell us some of your favorite memories uh, from studying or working here at this seminary? Right. At this campus. Right. Well, can I start with a nightmare or can I? Sure. <laughs> no, no. I, I, you know, I think that beginning of my first semester, like Dr. Arbino was like a shock to my system, <laughs> but it was like a good kind of shock. Yeah. And it was kind of something that woke me up that this was going to be something different. And I was actually really thankful, not at the moment, because uh, it was so difficult, but I was thankful that I kind of had someone like him at the beginning really make me aware that seminary was going to be transformational mm -hmm. and was going to really stretch me. And uh, it wasn't going to be just me learning a bunch of more facts about the Bible so that I could be an expert, but it was actually going to humble me in a lot of ways and make me more aware that I needed to go deeper and uh, that there was a whole other world, universe, that I needed to get into in order for it to be a more effective minister, but also, I don't know, just a more mature uh, believer and, uh, and human being and... Uh, 
So anyway, I, I, that was one of my early memories is getting shocked by Dr. Arbino, uh, which was good. Um, you know, I have, I have a lot of probably overall feelings and impressions. I, I'll try to think of something right now. My mind uh, is circulating uh, for a memory. There's going to be something that's going to pop into my mind. Um, hmm. Let me think. Let me think. Hmm. I'm having one of those blank outs, but, <laughs> but but yeah, I've had a lot of interesting moments here at the seminary. Um, hmm. yeah, like for my wife and I, uh, some of our favorite memories are um, making it through big life moments. Yeah. Uh, we had all three of our kids while we were here. Yeah. And then um, I had significant moments of realizing my gift for teaching, not yeah. just a call to ministry, but also that I have a gift of teaching and yeah. um, strong clarity that I I want to do by vocational ministry. Yeah. I really want to work in education at the same time as yeah. uh, working in ministry. Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, those those happened here. Yeah. You know, yeah. while I was here, I was staring at the bay from the bench. You know, yeah. the official bench. For staring yes. and thinking. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Can never forget the bench. You know. Yeah. So for us, that's those are two major areas that we think about. Yeah. I, you know, I would say that um, there's quite a few of the professors that have been very impactful. And it's been like moments like Dr. Faith Kim. And mm -hmm. we were in her class. And... She talked about the boy book boy, just this whole way of looking at people and how God transcends culture and he breaks through. And when you're sharing the gospel, you have to start with the boy, mm -hmm. with the person, with where they are and their culture. And, you know, and, I, and it sounds funny, but I remember being with these students and we we're all kind of looking at each other and going, this is just so simple, but yet so profound. Yeah. And and uh, I remember just laughing because I remember taking tests with her, and whenever I would draw, she would love that. <laughs> and uh, I never remember any of my teachers getting so excited <laughs> over me drawing. But if I drew, it seemed like I got extra points, so I just started drawing away <laughs> on any test she would give me yeah. uh, because she liked that. Yeah. And um, but I. Uh, you know, I think about Dr. Ganey and just his passion and ability to just grab a hold of us on a Saturday. And, you know, an all-day Saturday class, that's mm -hmm. tough. Yeah. But yep. he was able to keep us most of the time <laughs> in it. And uh, he was extremely tough, probably even more so than Arbino, the mm -hmm. most strict of all the professors. But I really respect and appreciated how he encouraged me. Yeah. You know, I remember that moment, him telling me in his class, even though I know I wasn't going to get a good grade <laughs> because I had missed an assignment that was important. Mm -hmm. But he told me, you know what? He said, Miguel, you can preach. You can preach and you need to keep, you know, keep going in that direction. Keep preaching God's word. And I remember how much that meant to me that someone that I saw as a leader and could really preach the word was telling me that. And this was this was before. I was the lead pastor. Mm -hmm. So this just really gave me that encouragement yeah. that I could do something like that if God wanted me to do it. I could do it. Yeah. I could do it. Because if Dr. Ganey says I can preach, you know, I can't be half bad. So th there were moments like that of affirmation by people that meant a lot. You know, Dr. Arbino shaking my hand after the sermon in, in December, telling me that I did the class proud because I had been taking a hermeneutics class leading into that um i just remember moments like that with professors that just meant the world to me mm -hmm. um and uh just learning through the missions conference mm -hmm. and and those type of things how big what god is doing around the world and um uh, uh seeing all the relationships that are have been impacted through Golden Gate over the years. Uh, we're not just this little tiny thing in Mill Valley. We are mm -hmm. so much more than that because of all the people that have come here have been impacted and have gone out 
You know, it's just mind blowing to think about all that. And then the diversity, you know, and obviously we can kind of use that as some kind of gimmicky thing. But I think there's people that genu- genuinely, when you look out, it doesn't matter where they're from. They've come here because God has brought them here. Yeah. And they are so, so much richer for having come here yeah. than anywhere else they could have gone. Yeah. Because of all the different folks, you know, that come culturally, spiritually, and uh, just academically. I mean, yeah, it's just incredible, yeah. you know. So I uh, didn't mean to sound like a commercial there, but no, it's fine. yeah, it's just amazing. Um, and then other students, just meeting people from different parts of the world. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing. Um, you know, people that will make you laugh and they don't even mean to. Uh, <laughs> they're learning English and, and yet they're here battling and trying to get through seminary. And I mean, that kind of woke you up and kind of gave you a little extra if here's a Korean student or a student from uh, from Africa, you know, and their English isn't even a first language and they're in there battling yeah. in that class with you. I'm like, what's what's your problem? You know, you, you got to get this done. So I think these students didn't always realize that they were mot- helping to motivate at least me. Yeah. You know, even though I came from another country, I came here when I was a baby. So mm-hmm. I learned Spanish as a second language. So I could really understand the battle of trying to study because I, I studied in Honduras with a second language and it's not easy. But um, yeah, so that kind of was a, a motivator at times. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, trying to think of some specifics too right now. Well, let's move to the next question. Sure. And if uh, a memory comes back, feel free to... Okay, yeah. great, great. Uh, being in seminary is a fair amount of work, and hopefully you achieve something out of the, the time you're here. So one of the things we've been asking people is, what is your most prized achievement that you earned while at this campus? This could be something like an award, something like that, or, you know, if you're wanting to go more sure. abstract. Sure. Um, I guess I was pretty honored um, in 2000, I think it was the 2010 graduation in my mind, I, I got the, I, I believe it's the Jack O'Neill Multi-Ethnic Award, mm-hmm. um, or the award that I guess recognizes who um, someone who is doing ministry or work in, in a multi-ethnic type of, mm-hmm. so our church, Lincoln Hill Community Church, is very uh, diverse and um, so I thought that was pretty amazing to receive an award like that. I don't necessarily think I was the top candidate, but it was still a nice moment that to me was just affirming that I was where God wanted me to be. Um, I always kind of wondered about myself growing up. Um, I, I, I joked around that I'm a, I'm a Hispanic that grew up listening to hip hop and country music <laughs> because my adoptive father loved country music and our neighborhood was hip hop and uh you know a little bit of country and a little bit of rock and roll you know and i would watch hee haw and i mean i have knowledge of things that i'm like what am i doing with this knowledge i had chinese folks around me growing up um african american i i and and yet i felt like a a stranger sometimes in in the worlds i was in 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 honduras i was called a gringo Mm -hmm. you know here i was called dirty names uh you know, Mexican this or that. And um, I'm like, I'm not even from Mexico. So, (laughs) um, but the the point is that now I understand all of these early experiences that I had with different cultures and, and groups. God was shaping me so that I could be a pastor of a church that has Vietnamese, Brazilian, Hispanic, Caucasian, African American, Iranian. Mm -hmm. He was preparing me for this craziness so to speak yeah. but it just makes sense and I, I I never could have imagined that growing up feeling rejected until I felt accepted in Christ you know um, but that's part of why God allowed all those things he was preparing me for this so that award was kind of like a confirmation of just I'm in the right place um, and then I think 
of being a part of starting the first uh, um, Hispanic student fellowship here on campus okay. um, is something that I'm really thankful for. And um, I hate to use the word proud because it sounds like I'm being prideful, but I am, I guess, in a sense, proud of the fact that we were able to do that. And, and uh, um, I wish we could have done more of that. And unfortunately, there was no one to take my place uh, once I was no longer a student to, to keep that going. Um, but I am really uh, excited that we had a on-campus event where we brought uh, Christian uh, pastors, Hispanic pastors and leaders from around the Bay Area here to have a conference. Um, and, and I think that that was like such a great moment. And I just wish we would have thought about it more on the bigger things. We should have probably had someone uh, coming from, I don't know what newspaper to, to you know, take yeah. Take a, a write a write a story about it. Take photographs. We didn't do enough in that regard. We were just new to what we were doing. We we're just excited to yeah. even have it. And um, James Page, who's a graduate of here, former pastor, he spoke at that. Um, uh, a couple of other well-known Hispanic pastors from the area that I can't think of their name right now. They spoke, um, and so that was a historic moment. And I just really hope that the seminary going forward really sees Hispanics as a part of the seminary in the sense of helping them to take the next step. I think that CLD is fantastic, but I think I want to see more Hispanics that are doing master's and doctorate work uh, because we need to set an example to our people that God can use us in all of these areas and we don't have to feel like we can't do it, yeah. you know, um, and I hope that my life and my testimony will be an encouragement to some other Hispanics that they can do it, too. Uh, you know, I, I would love to encourage other Hispanics because I wasn't a great student. I, I'm not a great student. But if God can use this crazy Honduran that grew up in that that barrio, that that inner city San Francisco with all my quirks and I was able to get as far as I have. I know that God can can help other folks as well. And uh, even now, that's part of the reason why I'm doing leveling work um, towards the um, doctorate, uh, the D-Men, uh, which we always say D-Men. And so saying the whole doctorate of ministry um, is part of what I'm looking at doing now, because honestly, for me, um, I, it's a dual thing. I want it to be something that can be useful to help our church, mm -hmm. but... I also feel a responsibility that I'm in a position that's very unique as a Hispanic Christian leader, pastor, whatever, to maybe help the next generation. But you need more examples, mm -hmm. yeah. more folks that other people can look to and say, hey, they did it so I can do it. So I feel that burden that I need to be an example for others. So it's mm -hmm. part of the reason that I'm pursuing it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Models, excuse me, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Models, because there weren't enough of those when I was um, going, you know, through my process. Yeah. Well, switching gears a bit to uh, more about the sale and yeah. the location sure. the questions. Um, so the the sales announced of the Mill Valley campus on April first, two thousand fourteen. April Fools. <laughs> right. <laughs> Prior to that date. So prior to April 1st, 2014, what was your impression of the relationship between Golden Gate Seminary's Mill Valley campus and her neighbors? You know, I always felt like there there could be a better relationship with our neighbors. I, I felt like there was a certain uh, level of, um, I don't want to use the word animosity, but there was, there was, there was a certain level of unfriendliness towards mm -hmm. the, the seminary. And then from some's just tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, Did you sense this as early as 2005 when you got here? Uh, yeah. This yeah. I, I, I felt like there wasn't a tremendous amount of warmth or uh, relationship between the seminary and the community. Um, that was one of the things that probably shocked me, probably, mm -hmm. that I wasn't expecting. Um, now, that's not to say that there weren't exceptions of, of sure. individual people yeah. that seem friendly, but there certain seemed to be a certain coldness and, you know, at best tolerance, at worst, just flat out, 
you know, you're, you know, we don't like those people. And, and part of that is just that feeling of a cold shoulder. Like you would greet neighbors. I'm a pretty friendly, outgoing person. And right, yeah. you could just sense that some people didn't want us here. They were not happy about the seminary being, being here, either for spiritual, religious reasons or just flat out. They didn't want the presence of this here mm-hmm. uh, for maybe other reasons. They they thought it would be better if there was nothing here or mm-hmm. or, or something else. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, how did that change, the impression of the relationship? Mm-hmm. How did that change, if at all, after the current president, Dr. Jeff Orge, announced the sale? Um, you know, I, I think... Um, I don't know if it changed it. I, I'd have to think about that. I, I don't know if people celebrated in their homes. No, I, I mean, changed your impression. Oh, your impression. Okay. Your I'm impression. like, was there a, a Mill Valley wide <laughs> celebration? I almost feel like there could have been, you know, there could have been some toasting going on. And I, I'm not surprised if there was. Uh, but <laughs> some, like some a, pool parties like broke Naboo, out across Mill Valley. Like a Naboo parade with Jar Jar. Right. The, the the Jar Jar leading the parade. Uh, <laughs> No, but uh, for me, your impression, yeah, of yeah. the the relationship between the seminary and the, and the neighbors. Do you, did your impression of that relationship change after the sale? Now, by this time, uh, mm-hmm. we've already established that yeah. you graduated and you you finished your employment here, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you weren't around as much as you had been. Right. But um, still, that being the case, do you think your impression changed at all? Uh, after that time or was it no I think it was more it was more I think it was it was uh, solidified cemented it was like everything I thought was right you know everything that I thought and even more that uh, and and leading up to that um, I remember the process of the seminary trying to go to the city council or whatever meetings uh, hiring that firm spending whatever enormous amount of money to help win over folks so that the seminary could continue to do some things here and yeah. expand in a in a good way yeah. um, and I remember that battle mm-hmm. and to me that battle just just helped to cement what I always felt and thought yeah. and then when the sale was done it was like yeah they what else could they do yeah. I just felt it was sort of um, it was a final culmination of all of all of that yeah. you know And uh, I was sad, but I kind of understood, too, they were never going to really be able to make it with Mm -hmm. our neighbors. There was no amount of money or 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 political politicizing, whatever that was going to convince people in this area that the seminary being here was a good thing. Yeah, especially even if you consider just the deferred maintenance they had on all these buildings. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Tishner Village is a. An apartment complex, uh, uh, one-bedroom apartments that you and I and Jonathan are actually yep. all pretty mm-hmm. familiar with. Oh, yeah. I lived there at oh, one yeah. time or yep. another. Yep. Uh, and that place is like a matchbox that's waiting yeah. to go up Yeah. Uh, because of deferred maintenance. Because yeah. all these things haven't been kept up because yeah. they either didn't have the funds or the permission. Right. Yep. And that's a huge problem. Yeah. And it was a problem for years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we can be sad about the seminary leaving on an emotional uh, side, but on a very practical side, something had to happen. Something really, really had huge had to happen. Yeah. Either convincing the community so that we could do it, or having to leave yeah. because there wasn't a better option in staying here. Mm-hmm. That just didn't make sense. Were you in on the discussions surrounding the potential sale before it was finalized? Uh, like, was. No, I I wasn't in on that. I mean, obviously, you have relationships with people over the years, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes you overhear things, or somebody might mention, "Hey, something big might be going down." I think that I had heard through the grapevine that something big was coming. Um, I was not completely unaware when the announcement was made i i you know and i don't remember the exact conversations or whatever but i think i wasn't completely shocked other than the fact that they chose to do it on april 1st which (laughs) seemed like is this a joke you know well dr orge explained that to us when we had our interview with him that it was it was dependent on when the 
the new owners were going to announce the sale in major mm-hmm. news outlets and that they right. wanted that Borge and the others wanted to do it first. They right. wanted to get to the staff so that the staff knew yes. from directly from them rather yes. than finding out in the Chronicle yes. or something else. Which is totally yeah, yeah understandable. Now, would you be good. able to remember if you felt like what you heard through the grapevine was like, do you think that was really close to the announcement, or do you think it was like way back leading up to the announcement? I think I probably had um, maybe a few months of hearing small things, okay, yeah. and it building, okay, and uh, as it got closer, um, getting a sense that something really big is is about to happen, mm-hmm. and I cannot remember in my mind's eye. I don't know if this is my appendix uh, bursting last year and my memory issues that have come from it, but I cannot remember if I knew it, through those conversations that there was a possibility that the seminary was going to be sold or moving in some way, It was, or if it was more of like there's just something big that's going to be announced mm. and it's about to happen. You know, it's, yeah. you know, it's right around the corner. Mm. But I think that I had kind of some... Um, kind of understanding that the seminary possibly could be selling mm-hmm. uh, before it actually was was uh, announced officially. Yeah, I feel like yeah, like that might have been something I, I learned about as a possibility. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, our next question you've actually already answered. Our yeah. next question is what is your, your what was your opinion about the sale at that time and why? And you've already shared that you felt it was. Um, yeah, Would you I use the word inevitable. Is I think it was inevitable. I think it was necessary. Yeah. Um, it, it's unfortunate that there was not another option. I think uh, if things could have been different and the seminary could have stayed, I think they would have. Yeah. And I really do believe the president and all of the things that he's explained that they really tried yeah. and they did everything they could. Yeah. Um, I think the only other thing that, and this is just me being a human and just speaking out loud, is that the seminary did a lot of things right, but if there's one thing I think would have been great to go back in time and to change a little, is that the seminary probably should have taken a different approach with the community from the beginning. I think the seminary saw itself as a place where you prepare leaders and then they go out into the local church to do the things they do. And that it was the local church's responsibility, not the seminary, to maybe have those relationships with the community. Mm -hmm. And I never heard this like as an official, but I feel like unofficially the seminary stance was we're not a church. Yeah. And I understand that. But I think we went too far with that and that we didn't do enough things that were community friendly. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we never did. I I I I, I know there were there were instances, but maybe um, what's the word? It's not fermenting. It, 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 um, nurturing that um, mm, yeah. relationship with the community could have been a bigger priority. Mm. Um, but again, this is hindsight 2020. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's the only thing that I, I, I can think back that maybe the seminary, the mindset wasn't, you know, at, in the best place when it came to community relations. Yeah. You know. It is now past moving day. Um, Mm -hmm. My boss's boss has been gone for a week. Mm -hmm. Uh, Has your opinion about the sale changed at all over the, the last two years? Um, you know, honestly, um, I don't think it's really changed. Um, I felt it was inevitable and necessary when it happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe not to the place that I feel now more at peace with it. Obviously, I had more of the emotional reaction, like, really? That's, you know, wow, you know, um. I think you have an emotional immediate reaction that's sort of like you want to like a denial thing. You're yeah. you're in denial. But obviously the logical side of you goes, okay, well why did this happen and when you hear why it makes sense. 
I think the only thing that's changed is that I'm at peace with it. And I actually applaud the seminary for being willing to take a risk and doing something different. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it takes sometimes a risk ministry life. And they took a huge one in some senses. And I applaud them for doing that and for thinking of the long term and not just letting the nostalgia and the tradition and what some of us might say, because there are still people that are very upset right now. There's some people that probably haven't stepped on this campus in a few months because they're upset. But I think you have to learn to have a loose grip to a certain degree as a person on this planet that follows the Lord Jesus because it's temporary. And I know I'm maybe taking it somewhere else, but whether it's a seminary, your house or whatever, this is temporary. This is just something that we are going to learn and God is going to take us through. But the goal isn't here. Mm -hmm. You know, we are uh, citizens of the kingdom of God. And I think that even with things like this, we have to kind of get back to that perspective so that it doesn't hurt us. Yeah, we're going to have emotions and feel lost, but we can't hold on to that. We got to learn to let go of some things and something new is going to come. As something dies, something else is born, is birthed out of that. And I, I think something's going to be born out of this deep down inside of me. The only other thing I would add is that I feel like in the last few months, I've gotten excited about the seeds that will grow out of this. Yeah. And that I really have a hope that in all of this, God's orchestrating something bigger, which is bringing the churches or the church in Marin closer together because we're not just looking towards maybe this. Maybe in the past there was an overdependence that the seminary, the mm-hmm. seminary, but maybe now we realize, hey, it's us. We've got to be the people of God here in Marin mm-hmm. and we've got to step up in ways that Maybe we would have done that a long time ago. The seminary wouldn't be leaving. I don't know. Mm. And so I'm hoping that this is an awakening for us to come together, um, the different congregations, and to serve together, help each other, yeah. reach out more. Um, I don't know. I'm just hoping that it even leads to revival, as crazy as that might sound. Maybe maybe God can use this to lead to revival yeah. in the church in Marin. So You've telegraphed this your answer is a little bit on this, sure. but we have one final question. Sure, sure. What do you hope the seminary will prioritize as they make this transition? Ah, that's a great question. Um, it doesn't have to be the yeah. main thing. Um, a couple of people that uh, a yeah. couple of people have taken that as what do we what What do you think should be the main thing? We don't mean that, right? Sure. What some be some of the tie mm-hmm. up in the Almost. in the top priorities that they have yeah i think they're starting to do this which i'm very excited about um um, a while back ago before i resigned my position i had actually uh, submitted a proposal to the seminary for a um a new position uh that would be kind of a liaison uh to work with hispanic churches and my vision was that the position would be one that would help to connect Um, leaders in Hispanic churches to the seminary and working in all kinds of capacities with CLD, with the masters, with the doctorate, and just being a bridge so that more Hispanic leaders could come and be a part of seminary. I think the seminary has already started going in that direction, which is what I was hoping. And it sounds like they've hired someone or one or two folks down south that what they're going to be doing is exclusively working with Hispanic churches Mm -hmm and creating those bridges with the seminary. That's very exciting to me. And I hope that in that, they're also going to be making it a priority to hire Hispanic adjunct faculty uh, that can teach. There are men, uh, possibly even women, that have doctorates. And there are some of them in Southern California right now, which God's timing is incredible. Those people are available there, and maybe there's more of those folks than there would be here. And... uh, I would really love to see the seminary make it a priority to add more Hispanics to their either core faculty or adjunct faculty yeah. in the next you know three to five years. Um, 
and then building the relationship with California Baptist University. I think that that's mm -hmm. fundamentally important. Mm -hmm. um, I think it can be a two-way street type of relationship, especially yeah. if we bring in CLD. Mm -hmm. We can help CBU by funneling CLD students maybe to CBU, maybe developing different types of programs where somebody can't do a whole um, degree at, at CBU, but they can take some of their training and teaching uh, because it's an expensive school as well. And scholarshiping would have to be in play as well mm -hmm. with some of that. But I'm hoping there could be more of a relationship between California Baptist University and Golden Gate where it's a win-win for both yeah. and, and helping to funnel. They are taking some strides in that direction too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a CBU um, professor who's affiliated faculty now with the PhD and THM program. Wow. That's so, great. Yeah. Yeah. So he gets to teach bachelor's level uh, courses there, but then teaches uh, graduate level stuff here or postgraduate level stuff here. Wow. That's fantastic. Uh, and advises. And advises. That's right. Yeah. I think that would be fantastic. Uh, you know, and I don't know how CBU is doing with their theological department, but it would be fascinating to see how they could yeah. help each other um, it's very in strong. those areas. I think it'll be... Very, the two institutions will be very fruitful in um, attending more conferences together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like the Evangelical Theological Society, uh, our region is the far west. So right. uh, ETS Far West is our region. And they usually meet in like San Diego or like Escondido or Temecula, something like that. And for people in Rand County, that's a long oh, distance nice. for a two-day conference. Sure. Um, but being based in Ontario now, uh, with so, so many more faculty there in that area, I think it'll be a lot stronger because, uh, I mean, Brea's been there a long time, but now right. you have Brea and you have the Ontario campus. Right. No, that's great. And so those two together going with the CVU faculty to ETS Far West or other conferences that are similar. Yeah. Um, I think we'll, we'll be very fruitful. Yeah, I think that is really exciting. Um, you know, and, and obviously I'm Hispanic, so I'm a little bit biased in my, you know, what I think is important, but I think there's such an untapped potential there that has not really been fully explored. Yeah. Um, and it's part of the reason why, you know, um, I'm suggesting this, but obviously I have a strong desire to see more folks in Latin America grow as leaders. Yeah. I think there's been an explosion of the gospel, in, including in Honduras and in Mexico and in, in other Latin American countries, but there's been a lack of strong leadership training. And so I love the partnership that Golden Gate now has with the Mexican Seminary. Right. I would like to see that go to the next level where maybe there's some partnering so that they can go to other countries in Latin America and even do some short-term uh, missions uh, uh, leadership training mm -hmm. to me the next wave of missionary some of the missionary work is to go and find ways to train leaders uh, sometimes in short term yeah. uh, where somebody can go for two weeks three weeks a month yeah. and help to train leaders in that you know country so they can do ministry yeah. so I just am excited to see if there's any way that the seminary can get involved with helping the Mexican seminary maybe develop a larger vision and go towards some of these other places that don't have seminaries, mm -hmm. you know, because there are countries that don't have seminaries. To move slightly back to your, uh, your statement about faculty, I do know that the, he'll be an adjunct for the Bay Area campus uh, heading up our TFE. Um, is a, a former uh, missionary in Mexico who's back here in the United States, and he's a of Hispanic, uh, a Hispanic background. Fantastic, uh, great guy, and he's going to be a, a phenomenal professor for us here at the Bay Area campus. Yeah, no, that's fantastic, and I'm trying to get educated myself. And one of my own personal goals in the next couple of years is to go to uh, places in Latin America to learn who's already on the ground level doing some of this and how do we help support more of that mm -hmm. or even bring people together that wouldn't have 
thought, you know, okay, well, what if you and you come together and we do this? Mm -hmm. Uh, And just not coming in to say, hey, let's show you how to do it, but how can we come and help you guys? Where are your needs? We can give you some training in that area. And then you use it in in a way that's contextually appropriate for where you're ministering. And I think there's a phenomenal need in that area. Um, I know there is in Honduras, and it's not the only country, but... um, Mm -hmm. It would be exciting to see more of that happen uh, yeah. in the future. Jonathan, do you have any more questions for Miguel? I think I, I think I've covered what I've, I've got. Do you have any? Uh-huh. Miguel, thank you for your time. You're welcome. We really appreciate your story. Uh, it, it's a, it's a helpful, really valuable contribution to what we're doing. Well, thank you guys for even asking me. It was, it was interesting and uh, uh, made me think even more about all of this and. <laughs> Um, thank you guys for, for letting me be a part of this. We're happy to have you. Happy to have you. Thank you. That was Miguel Rodriguez, pastor of Lincoln Hill Community Church in San Rafael, California. I have met Miguel and knew him, and I, I knew his mom. I I saw how hard they worked to, to study here. I didn't know all of the things that uh, she sacrificed to, to be able to attend here and to help provide uh, uh, a good life for her son Uh, I'm I'm humbled by by their sacrificial work uh, Mm -hmm. to advance the kingdom of God yeah Miguel and his mother uh, when I first met them I didn't really realize any of that either and and I didn't realize at the time what a significant impact they would have on me as, um, for Miguel, uh, a minister in the faith side by side, working together in the gospel efforts that we, we try to do in our limited ways. And, uh, for his mother, Agata, as she has taken on a kind of motherly role with me in some ways, um, the power of the gospel, I think, is evident in the lives of Miguel and his mother. I'm grateful for them. They are, I think, um, maybe not students that get on the marketing materials for Gateway Seminary, but they're model students, model alumni for Gateway Seminary. They worked hard. They worked hard like Anne Marie did, uh, if you listened to a previous episode. And they, they earned everything they got. I'm real grateful for them as as people and to get their story, or at least Miguel's part of their story, in in our interview. Miguel played... Uh, he, he may downplay how significant he was, but his role as a bilingual English-Spanish speaker, working full-time for the Contextualized Leadership Development Program Mm -hmm. was integral to making it the way it is in in, uh, the current era. Um, Yes, they had Spanish-speaking staff in the past. Um, It's not ignoring any of that. But if he hadn't been brought on at just that time, if they had hired somebody who was only an English speaker or maybe who was bilingual with something else like... Uh, Mandarin or Korean or Cantonese or something, CLD might look significantly different now. But they didn't. They hired Miguel. And he made, I think, a very strong impact, spending countless hours working to build that up and to to, um, encourage the the CLD centers that exist all over the, mostly the Western uh, United States, um, so his his story is is important and helpful, and I think characterizes what Golden Gate was like in these last ten fifteen years, especially. Um, so I'm real glad he talked to us. Our next episode will be with Mark Jantamasso, alumnus of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary from the 1990s, and a church planter. That's right, over on the East Coast nowadays. In the month of July, we released a new interview every week. 
but with the month of August, we're returning to our original format with a new episode every two weeks. You can find them, or older episodes, right here on the podcast app you're using right now. How convenient. Or even on YouTube. Episode 13 with Mark Jantamasa will be available two weeks from today on August 12th. We believe Mark Jantamasa has a, an important contribution to this project. You don't want to miss that episode, so if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. And again, to help us spread uh, Golden Gate's story, which is a, a snapshot of... Uh, Christianity at uh, this point in history, please rate and review so other people can benefit from the, the work that we've done to, to record this history. That's right. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. <laughs>